we don't talk about it much because it, it's, it's, it's shameful, especially for countries that are here and countries like the US, and that's the producing of weapons uh, that not only contribute to the CO2 emissions which affect climate change, but also fuel wars. We need to stop that, we need to, and they're not gonna stop that, not the companies, not the governments, they're not gonna stop that. We're gonna stop that. The people's gonna stop that. We're gonna, my call of action is to take the streets, protest, because no one's gonna listen to you. Hello and welcome to the Deutsche Welle debate at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Sarah Kelly. How are leaders making good on their commitments to create a more sustainable world? Five years ago, the United Nations wrote an ambitious to-do list addressing the world's most pressing issues, including climate change, poverty, and education. Now, the deadline to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals is 2030. And while some progress has been made, no country is on track to meet all of the goals. Our session today is a decade to deliver the global goals. We have a very distinguished panel. Let's get started. Achim Steiner is joining us as administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Welcome to you. Wanjuhi Jaroje is a climate activist and a global shaper from Kenya. Welcome. Thank you. Mohamed Aljunda is an activist focusing on refugee rights and education. And Paul Stoffels is vice chairman of the executive committee and chief scientific officer at Johnson & Johnson. Thank you so much to all of you for being here today. And please, let's welcome our panel. And Ahim, I'd like to begin with you because you have been a champion of the Sustainable Development Goals from the very beginning. You also had a role to play in the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. Set the stage for us. What does our world look like in 10 years if we do not take dramatic action now? I think uh, it will be a more stressed world. It will be a world where if we do not believe in our capacity to work together to solve these problems, we will increasingly turn against each other. That may be sometimes for geographical or uh, political reasons, but you know, just look at the debate right now on are we going to act together on climate change or are we going to have to change our global trade system to the point where those countries who are not coming along and going towards a low carbon economy will in future have to pay tariffs in order to import goods into another part of the world that is acting on this issue. So I think the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, should first and foremost be understood as an extraordinary um, collective view of the future, of the greatest risks we face, and therefore also the goals we need to set ourselves to address them. That's the 17 goals. But much more important perhaps in here are some of the lessons from the recent past. Leave no one behind. It's a very easy phrase to cite, but just Think for a moment the evening news last year. Riots, people stepping out on the streets, dissatisfaction, unfairness, inequality. Those are the drivers that are also dividing us in our own society. So the SDGs are not just a set of lofty goals. They're actually a risk map of the world and they are a proposition on how to address them. But young people around the world, we have to say, you mentioned people out on the streets. Um, we saw four million young people out on the streets this past September, of course, with the climate strikes. Um, they say that it's not enough, that there is certainly not enough progress. Wanjuhi, I'll, I'll turn to you now because you're a climate activist. Um, you're of the generation that, that is currently protesting. Um, you're also, you know, you're doing grassroots activism, trying to organize local communities for climate action. Have you been able to have the kind of impact that you would like? So thank you, Kelly, for having me. And um, so 2018, we ran a huge campaign called Save Our Forest, KE. Um, that was very successful. We managed to push the government to impose a ban on harvesting of forests, of trees in community and public forests. However, um, the village uh, where I come from was very angry and they turned against me. And they were uh, justified to do that because I had taken away their only source of income um, without giving them an alternative. And that pushed me to realize that I was going uh, through this the wrong way, and I feel that the world um, needs to rethink. Yes, it's important that we put pressure, we start asking um, the governments and organizations rethink their ways of doing things, but we also need to think about the how. I feel that the how are we going to transition has been missing in the entire conversation. So this is my village feeling the heat of 
uh, the ban on harvesting of, law, of trees. Um, but this is the same with the uh, international organization, big organizations that do business. Because at the end of the day, um, the primary goal of any organization, any business, is to make profit. Um, but how do we transition from fossil fuels to um, more sustainable uh, products and services. That is something that has actually been up for debate here, though, what the primary responsibility of a corporation should be. We'll get to that a little bit um, later in our program. But Mohammed, I'd, I'd like to turn to you first so you can tell us a little bit more about your story, because um, you're very much fighting for refugee rights, for education. Um, you have a school, actually, that you started in Lebanon. And um, it's an initiative which has really been informed by your own personal experience. You're a Syrian refugee. You settled first in Lebanon. Now you're in Sweden. Tell us more. Well, uh, as you all know, in 2011, a revolution happened in, in Syria. Um, my, uh, my parents had to take part of the protest because the protests were for the future of the children. They were to make Syria a place where we can actually develop and improve ourselves. Uh, that, led to, that led to my mom getting arrested twice and then get death threats, so we had to flee the country. And when we arrived to Lebanon, which is a neighboring country to Syria, I couldn't go to school for almost three years, um, so I decided to set one for myself. And now the school teaches around 740 students every six months, and uh, we've been running for around five years. So we graduated uh, around 7,000 participants, including women, men, uh, and children. The women and men we work with are mainly the mothers. And now I, I live in Sweden, and I took the mission of um, trying to bring back the focus on certain issues that, in a sense, has been forgotten uh, by the public because activism is like anything else, is a trend. Um, and we do realize, as people who come from those backgrounds, that climate change is important because we live the impacts of it every day, but we need to bring back the focus on certain issues like education mm. to, for, a, for, for, for us to lift those in, in such regions up so they can start caring about climate change. Education SDG 3. Um, we're going to turn now also, uh, excuse me, Education SDG 4. Yeah. We're going to turn now to SDG 3, which is health and well being, um, uh, to Johnson and Johnson, the world's largest healthcare company. You, you're obviously in an incredibly influential position in order to make progress in this area. So tell us what you're doing. Well, we try to translate good science and uh, good science and technology into real applications for progressing health in the world. Yeah? And so today, there's an enormous progress in science and technology to solve the most important diseases in the world. The, we have made an enormous progress over the last so many years in infectious diseases with vaccines, uh, in neglected tropical diseases with new medicines, in, in mother child care, that with, with much better care. And so progressing that, that progress should continue. But on the other hand, the challenge of, of the new diseases, which now become almost equal everywhere in the world, is like mental health, dementia, diabetes, um, uh, essential healthy surgery, essential surgery, all those science and technology exist. We need to translate it in order to making it available to as many as possible people in the world for the health and well-being. Health is the most important factor in well-being, and we have to make sure we use the best technology in the world to uh, make that happen. And the big question that we asked at the beginning of the session is, is the world on track to deliver those sustainable development goals? Um, I'd just like to check with the team to see if we perhaps have some results on that. I'm not seeing them at the moment. But in the meantime, Ahim, I'll turn to you um, and ask you um, about some of the challenges. You know, perhaps we can, we can have an open and, and honest conversation about this, because the reality is as follows. I mean, when it comes to climate, biodiversity, these trends are moving backward. Are you worried that we're not going to get there? Absolutely, and I think this is why, you know, also at the United Nations, we continuously try to provide the world with a, a scorecard and a way to monitor progress, because clearly, um, in one sense, we are not getting there if you take um, everybody on the planet together. But it's also important to recognize where we are getting there, and many countries, many communities, on many goals are actually progressing. And that's why I think it is important to not take the collective failure to move fast enough at the moment as a reason not to believe that this can work. On the other hand, and this is what we see also here at the World Economic Forum every year, too many for too long have simply held on to yesterday's economy. 
because it actually serves some very well. Mm. But what it has done is it has prevented tomorrow's economy from emerging, from being financed, from being put in the hands of those who actually have the most to benefit from it. So much of what we also are discussing when we talk about climate change or access to health um, is essentially inequality. And this is why I think we are in some ways at a point where people are now questioning the whole concept of globalization. You know, as human beings, we will always trade with each other. I think to, to argue that we would step away from a notion that we belong to you know, planet Earth in which many people do things with each other would be a strange thing to do at the beginning of the 21st century. But the rules of the game are simply leaving too many people out. And so, back to one point, I think we're now talking about the how. Mm. So the SDGs should not be, I think, questioned because they are, in a sense, an expression of wisdom. They're not the answer to everything. The question is, how do we actually make it happen? And this is a very different time, including in terms of opportunities. Again, here in Davos, we learn a lot from the frontiers of technology, the digital economy that's emerging. Extraordinary opportunities for inclusion, but if you don't make the right choices about how to use it, it could actually <coughs> amplify inequalities. So this is, you know, human history repeats itself, and here we are at the beginning of the 21st century. Mohammed, would you like to respond to that? I mean, what, what do you think is most important when it comes to achieving the sustainable development goals? I mean, we've always talked back, uh, back in the refugee camps in the school that having 17 goals turns into more of a wish list rather than goals. And uh, what, we, what, we were, uh, what we usually discuss on the streets, because that's where I was born, that's where I was raised, that's where my education from the streets is, if you have a goal, which is 17 goals, which are a lot of goals, we need to start prioritizing some of them. Uh, the problem is if we continue treating those goals as the, depending on what's trendy on the activism, like for example nowadays climate change, we won't be able to go anywhere. Because if we're going to discuss climate change, because it's the biggest issue and the World Economic Forum have been putting emphasis on it since we came here, which is an important issue, and we've been impacted by it in the Middle East, and I do recognize it, and it's going to affect every, everyone. So we need to work on it. But the problem is if the focus is so much on that specific issue and other issues, not by the United Nations, but by other actors, are forgotten, like education, like inequality, like health, if those other issues are forgotten, the rest of the world wouldn't be able to care about climate change, wouldn't be able to join the fight for climate change. And we're seeing this happening. I was in Lebanon a couple months ago, and I'm in contact with my fellow in Lebanon, in Mexico, in South Africa, and everywhere, and we talk about them, and they do care about climate change, but they're not doing anything about it, and they tell me it's not our problem. So if you have a whole region who's saying climate change is not their problems, I think this is an issue. And when I, when I ask the question, the answer is usually, we're, we're not there yet. We're not, we can't do anything about climate change yet because we don't have school, because we don't have food on our tables, because we don't have good health. So we need to stop treating activism as a trend because it's not a trend. It's not because someone got famous, we need to start focusing on that specific issue. People are on the streets struggling and dying every day. I came here, last, last word, I came here, there's a plenty of sessions, most sessions, are about uh, climate change, which is fascinating, as again, we support climate change. But there is zero sessions about Yemen. It's one of the biggest humanitarian issues nowadays. People are dying because of hunger, and there's zero sessions about it. There's zero sessions about the social movements that are happening in a lot of the world, like in Hong Kong, like in India, like in Lebanon, like in Iraq. What's going on? We're not focusing, we can't focus on trends. Because we, we can't continue to be self-centered in Europe and in the US. Because there is the rest of the world, and we come from the rest of the world. Anjuvi, would you like to weigh in there? Um, Mohammed raises a very fundamental point of meeting the basic needs of people um, before we can talk of climate change. But we need to realize that all, things, all these things are intertwined. Um, if, uh, if our farms, if our farm produce is destroyed, for instance, there was flooding in Kenya, then we will not have food security. So, um, but the primary mandate of every government is to ensure that the people, uh, they improve and protect the lives of the people. That's a mandate of government. And government has failed. That is why people are on the streets. That's why um, we ran the campaign to save our forests, because there was massive destruction of our forest. So governments have failed on their mandate. And I want to speak for um, on the global south especially. Yes, we are the least emitters, but then we also have a role to play in, it, in terms of creating strong policies. You know, the truth is that if there is money to be made legally, somebody is going to make money. 
out of it. Um, I also feel bad and I see that there is a lack of um, will to move forward when, when an organization or a company like Coca-Cola uh, comes out and says that we are not going to ban one uh, uh, single-use plastic uh, because people uh, said that they should uh, remain. I think it's it's just wrong. Uh, I come from Nairobi where when it rains, it floods. And, and, and there are times when children uh, spend the night in school buses because um, the, 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 the sewer systems are clogged by PET bottles. And there are photos even on the internet. If you were to Google, you will find, if you were to Google uh, bottle, uh, plastic bottles uh, and floods in Nairobi, you will see uh, they're in the thousands. So when we say that we're not willing to face out, we want to go uh, for the easy way out. I question our intention. And I think the word for the decade, because we know what we ought to do, but we are not doing. I feel for me the word for the decade should be intentionality. Because when we are intentional, then we are accountable. And it's the only way we are going to move above our legal uh, responsibility and, and put people first. Start focusing on things like uh, food, start focusing on things like education, prioritizing uh, climate change, prioritizing protecting our biodiversity as well, because we know that all these things are intertwined. Look at what is happening in Australia, and it is uh, directly linked to what is happening in East Africa. You know, the fires and the flooding, they are interlinked through uh, Indian Ocean uh, Dipole. Paul, are companies taking the easy way out, as Andrew, he just mentioned? I mean, talk to us, because... Here at the World Economic Forum, stakeholder capitalism is, is certainly um, a very big topic this year. It seems to be on, on the lips of every single CEO, but is it really happening? And does it have the potential to happen in a way that is meaningful and that can exact change and progress toward the SDGs? Uh, as an individual, I say, we as companies and we as a Western world, we have to do much more, much faster. But I'm, as a healthcare person, I see optimism uh, and I want to be optimistic on what has been achieved over the last few years and going forward. If you look, look at child mortality in Africa and, and in the world has dramatically de decreased with maximizing the use of vaccines to prevent diseases. Yeah? Um, the, the, the child mortality in birth has dramatically decreased because of training and, and new types of ways of, of caring for mothers. All of those those, uh, if you look at HIV now, with the Global Fund, yeah, um, people who didn't have any life expectancy 20 years ago now can normally, with, with the help of the global community, live lifelong, normal, near to normal life. So the progress is there. Um, what we need is a, a strong partnership between those who develop technologies, those who bring, bring technologies uh, to the world, but also those who implement. And I heard education. I think we need many more healthcare workers in the front lines to be able to, uh, to work with people. We need, the, we need the partnership with the countries to bring new technologies, but also make them very effective in getting real impact. And you have been very effective with those new technologies. I just, I just want to highlight um, one particular point is, for example, your um, tuberculosis treatment um, has, has received um, a lot of accolades, but it's been criticized for its pricing. Um, can you do more? I mean, can you make a commitment here to do more, for example? We do a huge commitment to make sure that every person in the world get access. And uh, in the, over the last two years, in the last three, four years, we treat more than 180,000 patients with XDRTB. We have a huge implementation organization in the world doing that. Um, uh, when countries can't pay or organizations can't pay, we donate. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So half of what we do is donation. Now, on the other hand, there are countries and there are governments in the world who have ability to pay. And so it should not all be donations because it has to be a, a sustainable world. Yeah? And it's the same for the HIV medicines, although very low price. It's an industry who produces today thousands of tons of new medicines and you need a huge industrial capacity to continue to do that. So it are small amounts of money, but at the same time, it is, makes it sustainable. If something is a donation, it's not sustainable. Uh, and so we have to work with, with all the partners involved to make sure that everyone who needs it get access in an acceptable okay, way. So you've highlighted some of the complexities when it comes to achieving the SDGs um, from the perspective of, of business. And Achim, I'd like to turn to you now and ask you about those complexities from the perspective of politics, because young people around the world are calling for no compromise. That is really clear. Um, what is possible right now when we look at the limitations of politics, though? 
May I offer perhaps an interpretation of that no compromise? I think our young people are actually extremely wise and savvy people. Their call for no compromise is a judgment on the very bad compromises that they have been sold over the years. So I think what they're saying is no more of that kind of compromise. Um, I think when I listen to young people today, whether they're engaged on environmental issues, on issues of human rights, on education, on refugees, um, first of all, I find a generation that is extraordinarily well informed, um, much more able to judge for themselves what is right and wrong, and therefore I think playing a much larger part in the public debate. So when we sit here in Davos and we talk about stakeholder capitalism, there are two things that are in a sense coming together. One is, look, capitalism is essentially about an economy in which capital really determines what happens. And so when we start talking about stakeholder capitalism, it's an interesting moment because what you're essentially positing is, look, capital cannot be the single and sole determinant of what happens in our society. So can stakeholders really be shaping that outcome if they don't own capital? So this is the debate of our time. And I think it's extremely interesting that we are at a point where clearly the paradigm of the 20th century, where economic growth, per capita income, where the determinants of success clearly are being challenged left, right and centre, whether from an ecological point of view, from an equity, fairness point of view. So we are on the verge of having a new paradigm emerge and I think it is the stakeholders that ultimately are reminding our economies that, look, you may own the capital, but we are the people who buy your products, we are the people who take your services, we are the people who actually own the money in this economy, even if you've given it to banks, to pension funds. And this is, I think, the, the interesting conversation of our time. It's not a compromise, it's a kind of reassertion that yes, there are people who have capital, but then there are markets, there are democracies, there are societies, and I think that is a discussion that is extremely timely because, frankly speaking, simply replicating the 20th century economy into the 21st century is going to lead us to more and more crisis. And here, if I may just say one thing to Mohammed, part of the reason why we have the Sustainable Development Goals is precisely to not allow governments um, or indeed capital markets to simply say this is the one thing that matters and everything else is secondary. This, the SDGs are by definition a reminder that living together on this planet with eight, nine billion people, you have to address these issues together. It's a systems agenda if you want and within that each one of us can identify things we're passionate about. So the SDGs are in a sense the operating system of our 21st century societies and each one of us can put an app on it and say I'm a refugee, I want to do something for the people I come from and I care about, but I don't think we need to trade one off against the other because frankly speaking, climate change is not more or less important than education or employment, but it is probably the most dangerous issue right now on which inaction threatens us in the short term. Mohammed, your response. Uh, <laughs> I mean, again, I, I'm not arguing that climate change is not the I most... Think we yeah, agree, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We both yeah. agree that climate change is the most important issue. But as you said, if, if we want to put... Um, if we want to, in, in a sense, represent the SDGs, in a, try to represent the SDGs equally to a certain extent, of course, then let's actually try to do that. I agree. My, my, my point is not that, the, that we need to prioritize one goal and then, and then focus on that and solve it, because, as you said, everything is interconnected, so we can't just focus on one. But if you really consider all SDGs are, in a sense, equally important and we need to work on them all, then we need to treat them as such. We can't treat the SDGs as a trend. We can't just look at them because now that's what all, all the media is talking about and everyone's talking about. We need to focus on that. Because the world can't be self-centered. There's no center of the world. We can't work like that. It happened that the, that the capital or most of the power is centered in one place, which is here where we are now in Davos, for instance. And we need to use those platforms and we need to use where we live in order for us to distribute this power or this wealth to other parts of the world like where I come from in order for us to lift those people to start caring about, start caring about the most important issue nowadays, which is climate change. But if, for example, if we considered, which is a very uh, imaginary world, uh, a utopian one, if we considered Europe became 100% green, what about the rest of the world? We all know if not, not the whole of the world contributed to, uh, to decreasing the CO2 emission in the world, we, won't, we, won't, we will, of course, make a progress, but we won't reach the point we want to reach. Mm -hmm. So we, again, and I will repeat it again, we need to stop those, we need to stop 
we need to stop considering those issues as trend because they're not. They're here and to stay. Yes, they're going right. to stay. And if we continue investing in one thing just because it's the trend, we're not going to go anywhere. But there are um, enough people, sorry. Yeah, Paul, my question was coming to you next, but first I just wanted to quickly tell everyone we got the results of our poll. Mm -hmm. um, we asked a question um, at the beginning of this program, and it was with 10, excuse me, is the world on track to deliver on the 2030 agenda? And you can see it there. The clear answer from 100% of you is no. <laughs> so, <laughs> we are here having the correct conversation today, which is what yeah. it is that we need to do about it. Um, I wanted to ask you actually about partnerships, but do feel free yeah, also to first respond. First, on, on the comment here, um, different parts of society will have to work within their capabilities to make a difference for the world towards SDG. I have no capabilities in climate, but we have massive capabilities in healthcare. And health will continue to be a very big part of well-being in the world. So for us, focusing on making sure we make the difference there. And today, we are confronted again, as, you, as everyone is now aware, with the new coronavirus. Yeah? And so pandemics are partly part of a result of a climate change. Dengue is a result of a climate change. Uh, um, Ebola is a result of a climate change by bats moving around the world to different regions and spreading Ebola. And so our industry, me and, uh, and our teams, we, we made, we make, uh, we are working on tools to prevent with vaccines. And at the moment, we are vaccinating, uh, we are on the way to vaccinate 700,000 people in the Kivu region and in Rwanda to prevent them from getting infected. So we ha all have to have our tasks in order to make sure that we contribute to the SDGs the maximum we can with our respective industries. And that's where we are worried about climate change and how do my best as a person, as an industry, we absolutely will be by the first to get to CO2 neutral in our, uh, in our company. But that's not, not good enough for us. We need to have massive impact on health uh, as a result of the climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we, we're getting some questions actually in from all of you, and I'd like to pose one of them um, to Wan Juhi. And, and this is a, a big question, yes. so I hope you're ready. What is the biggest game changer to mobilizing action? In your um, view, in your experience, because I mean, you have you have been on the ground. Maybe you can tell us um, about what you saw when you were taking action. So I was born and brought up at the foot of Mount Kenya, um, and I grew up surrounded by the forest. It's a beautiful place, and I grew up with a father who was a tree hugger. So I started planting trees when I was about five years. So I've been planting trees since I was five years, um, and we we coexisted with the forest. But in 2017, I would go home quite often because the Global Shippers Nairobi had a project uh, setting up a library and a city center in my village. And so I would go home quite often. And I would meet uh, trucks upon trucks with uh, logs, uh, ferrying logs out of the forest. And I would take photos and just keep quiet. But then the community reached out and said, we are going to wipe out our entire forest. They're going to wipe out our entire forest if you don't do anything. Um, there is no... Uh, um, you can never mobilize, you can never achieve, um, um, you, you can never be a true activist if you work alone. So you have to work with the people. But the most powerful tool is storytelling. So the reason we were successful was because we had collected uh, photos, we had videos, we had people joining and sharing their personal stories. And then we created a hashtag, which is Save Our Forest KE. Um, and, and that became the platform where every Kenyan would show the destruction of forest around them. Um, rivers drying up, um, uh, people are talking about poor harvests. We would also use photos, for instance, of cars that have not been washed, and we would say, you know, this is, this is the reality. There was also a, short a shortage of water in Nairobi, and we would show photos of cats being pulled and people buying water. So this was very, very personal, um, and we created a movement that pushed the government to take action. Yeah, but we, you can never move forward without the people. The most, um, the easiest way to achieve, uh, to progress or to, to, to achieve change is through uh, moving with the people. So perhaps the lesson learned is that anyone can mobilize. Anyone can mobilize. You just have to have an anyone idea. Can Everyone mobilize. can really do yeah. their part. Um, Mohammed, you um, were mentioning actually in your first an answer a little bit earlier that it was your feeling at least that there were many people around the world who felt that it wasn't impacting them and therefore they did not care. Um, fair assessment? No. Yeah. So somebody asked the following question. Um, what would make the SDGs meaningful to an everyday person? Do you perhaps have any ideas or insights? I mean, I, I do think the SDGs are meaningful to, to, to most people because they, they are representations for the problem, what, the, what, the, what their problem is. 
if, if you want to make them more meaningful, I think basically just highlight those people who's being impacted by uh, who's, who the SDGs represents, the stakeholders. Um, I mean, for, for I'll, I'll take I'll take a wide example. For ex uh, on on the media, it's not only on those stages, but everywhere. You know, like the Amazon's fires, we all heard about it. We all felt um, deeply concerned when the Amazon's fire. But there's a lot of indigenous people who lost their homes because of the indigenous fires, who maybe died, and the deforestation continues in the Amazons. It didn't stop. Uh, we don't hear much of those indigenous people voices, not anymore, at least. In Canada, there is, they're building oil uh, pipelines and they're impacting the indigenous people homes and we're not hearing about those indigenous people much who are one of the main stakeholders for climate change, who are suffering on the ground. We, we need to understand that if people want to take SDGs, people I'm talking, us, the one who are on the streets, if they want to take the SDGs seriously, they need to see that people that, uh, that cooperates and international organizations who present the SDGs or present as the fathers of SDGs need to also take those people seriously. They need to lift them up. They need to represent them and they need to allow those people to represent themselves. We were having a dinner the other day and we were talking also. There's a really important point. Most of the people who have been impacted by such issues don't have a voice, not only because no one is representing them, but a lot of times, if they want to have a voice, they're going to risk their lives. I come from countries where we have a lot of dictatorships, and if I want to convey my real message, I'll probably be killed or imprisoned. What we need to do is we need to ask people what are those messages in order for us to try to convey them. That's why what I try to do is, for example, when I went to, I went to a short trip to Mexico, I tried to talk with the indigenous people there who, if they talk, they might be imprisoned, and I'm here to, to tell their message. The same way I expect you to tell my message because I can't say it. We need to recognize that oppression generally and inequality is really important for people to start considering those SDGs as meaningful. Because if they don't live in a world where they can comprehend the idea of solving, comprehend the idea of reaching the, one of the SDGs goal, goals, they can't take it. They can't take it seriously. They can't consider it meaningful. And people can make change because they are the main stakeholders. They are the voters. They are the buyers. But we need to start looking at them and treating them differently. Mm. We need to actually represent them the, way, the same way they represent everyone else. So awareness, exposure, communications, um, all of these things we need more of. Um, Ahim, I'd like to also ask you about incentives as well, and um, perhaps your view on that, because somebody wrote the following question. Um, shouldn't countries that outperform the SDGs be commended, for example, an SDG bonus, and those that underperform be penalized? Well, maybe in another century we'll live in a world where, you know, the collective can punish individual nations. I think we are far from that. And I think, frankly speaking, you know, the SDGs... But are you frustrated that you don't have that mechanism? No, because I don't think that's what will make people do things. What, what I think the SDGs are, more than anything else, they are a reflection of who we are, who we want to be, or where we are failing to be what we would like to be. You know, I don't have to explain to anyone that, you know, solidarity, reciprocity, empathy are good things. I mean, you go into a schoolyard and you watch a group of students, you know who the bully is. Who is going to want to be associated with that person? Maybe for tactical reasons, temporarily, and you can extrapolate that to geopolitics, but we all know <laughs> who we actually would gravitate towards, right? The SDGs are, in a sense, an expression of who we think we are. And I go back to Andrew's point, intentionality. I lead an organization in the United Nations called the UN Development Program. It is absolutely committed in an explicit way to the intentionality of helping people across the world to have more choice. And I think what I believe in is that, first of all, we must challenge paradigms that tell people that they cannot do something. This is why when I led the United Nations Environment Program, I spent a great deal of time in challenging the economic paradigm, making, in a sense, an environmental sustainability case economically literate, because it, we have been told all the time that this is the only way that you can develop, that you can you know, um, address poverty. And it's not true. But at the end of the day, what we must try and do, and whether it is in your village in Kenya, and you know, there is a great precedent that you have, Wangari Matai equally began planting trees, but she very quickly realized that it is actually women and peace and the broader setting that will make planting trees so much more meaningful. 
We live in a time where most of us are somehow being given the sense that things are too complicated. We do not understand them. Others must decide for us. Others will manage our money. Others will manage our digital economy. Wrong. We have to learn to become part of a movement that says we have choices to make and we need to be informed and then let us exercise those choices. From there on, all sorts of you know, political tactics, movements, um, economic alliances can be built. But I think from a very personal point of view, I agree, intentionality is extremely important. First of all, you have to commit to something that allows you to know where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it allows others to also judge you. And we don't have to send armies into countries that are not planting trees. I don't think that will help us a lot. <laughs> but countries will very quickly understand that those who plant trees may be a hell of a lot better off than those who think they can live without them. And I think that is part of our age of knowing things. Paul, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I think if you have the privilege as a leader to come to this forum here to be part of the, the world, uh, working on the world's health, the world SDGs and the future, you also have to be, have an accountability. And each in our industries, we should go back and take our accountability, what we can do and make a commitment over the next so many years or the next year, what are we going to do in order to take our responsibility? And as a representative of the healthcare community, we are meeting here to have that type of discussion on how can we jointly make more difference. And is it about sharing data? Is it about collaborating in pre-competitive pre fields? But you have to have your accountability towards the future. It's intentionality, but it's also leaders have to have their accountability to Somebody make Somebody writes the following question. How should governments and business cooperate in order to achieve the SDG goals? Um, I think the only way that cooperation can work there is, is both act as humans and make sure that we go for inclusiveness of everyone in the world. And it's corporations are collections of people, governments are collections of people, and it are the people who need to work together. Every one of us is a human being, and if we take the strength of who we are and bring that to the table, and the strength we represent from our government, for our company, for the good of the world, let's work together on have the most possible impact. And having an open forum where you can discuss, where you can brainstorm, where you can say good ideas come out, and then go back home and make it work. Wanjuki, are you satisfied with that answer? I've seen you shaking your head over there on the end. <laughs> so, so I want to say that it's very, very simple. It's putting the common good above self. Because majority of us are driven by selfish interests. You find the business will go to government and negotiate for personal interests. They want to pay lesser taxes. They want uh, certain be laws not to be implemented because they are going to hurt. And I look at the timber industry in Kenya, for instance, that continue to destroy our forests. But there are many other ways of benefiting from it. But I want to respond to both um, um, the UNDP rep and uh, Paul, and, and say that first Global Shape has sent me to tell you thank you very much uh, for recognizing nurses and midwives and prioritizing mental health. But they also asked me to challenge you on why uh, we do not have uh, any center, any innovation center in Africa where um, you could be building capacity for more um, and, and more research. Um, especially now that we have many young people. In 2050, we'll have about 77% uh, youth. Um, my challenge to the development partners, I feel you've, you do not do enough in terms of holding uh, your member countries accountable. When I look at my country, we have about six articles in the constitution that speak about the environment. But then the constitution requires acts to, 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 to operationalize. But when you look at the acts, um, they have such loopholes that allow for the destruction of forests. Kenya is the only country that has a climate change um, act, which was passed in 2016, but it has never been implemented. When you look at Africa Union, uh, it's still in its draft form since 2017. Yet when we, you know, these leaders have mastered ways of, um, you know, the peer language. So they know what to say to be clapped for. But do you hold them accountable? Um, though somebody told me that um, if we solve all the problems, the UN will close office. Is, I don't know. That, that sounds like a call to action. Um, and actually, we, we only have a couple of minutes left for our conversation, um, full disclosure. So I am going to allow everyone to respond to that. Um, are you going to accept that call to action? Do you, do you have another call to action? Or do you have another commitment that you would like to make? These are our final thoughts now. Paul, you have the first response. Well, I 
heard the call to action and I promised that I will be in Africa having a debate with young shapers and Thank young you. people Thank in technology you. and figure out how we can accelerate innovation in Africa like we do everywhere in the world. We will not leave that behind. So Holding let's make an appointment in Kenya yes. and I'll come and see you there. You. Uh, I have a call to action uh, to, uh, to what I said earlier is to make commitments, each of us as an industry, to what we can commit to the SDGs by what our capabilities is the strongest. And that is bringing better health to as many people as possible in the world. Ahim. <laughs> Well, to the question of uh, innovation, I actually have a very good story because in UNDP we just launched 60 accelerator labs and 30 of them have been established in Africa. So we are betting on Africa, partly because I think what happens next in Africa will define a great deal for what happens elsewhere in the world. And in terms of a call, I would simply say, you know, the 100% we are not on track to fulfill the SDGs. You can sit back and say, well, that obviously makes the SDGs irrelevant. Big mistake. So take that seriously. It is a way of not just doing what you care about, it reminds you that we operate in systems and so what matters to you may be of consequence to someone else. That's why the SDGs are a way of bringing us together and not to distract us from what is important to each one of us. Wanjuhi, what are your final words? My call to action is to the young people. We have so much power. Um, we are, we, we are 3.5 billion um, globally. And we, we have the power to say no to all organizations and companies, their products and services, all those that do not prioritize people and planet, and say we are going to boycott them. And let us, and, and I would call young people and, and ask us to boycott um, products from any company that does not prioritize people and planet. Any company that is such taking, as such as Coca Cola. Ah. <laughs> well. <laughs> for our viewers at home, um, there were just claps in the audience for that. <laughs> Okay. Um, Wanjuhi, those are your final words. Um, Mohammed, I, I neglected to mention at the beginning of this um, that you are actually still in high school, which I think uh, people would um, find difficult to believe. Um, it's so incredibly impressive um, what you have been doing. You're the future. So therefore, I'd like to give you the final word. Well, there's, an, there's a point that I haven't said and that I feel it's all for all of us, it's important to remember and to start saying. Uh, young and old, that uh, which we don't talk about it much because it, it's, it's, it's shameful, especially for countries that are here and countries like the US, and that's the producing of weapons uh, that not only contribute to the CO2 emissions which affect climate change, but also fuel wars. We need to stop that, we need to, and they're not gonna stop that, not the companies, not the governments, they're not gonna stop that, we're gonna stop that. The people is gonna stop that. We're gonna. My call of action is to take the streets, protest, because no one's gonna listen to you. I've been here for four days and no one has been listening. So, take the streets, protest, because if we're going down, we're gonna take them down with us. Okay. I've just been told by my producer that we have been gifted some extra time. Therefore, I will ask one final question: What will you personally? That was your call for action for others. What will you personally do, Wanju? Um, I, I commit to saving forests in Kenya and finding ways of um, coexisting, um, particularly for communities living around forests. Um, how do we benefit from forests without um, destroying the natural state of forests? And I'm, I'm also committing to work with organizations, with companies, to transition from harmful practices to better practices. That is my everyday job. Uh -huh. You know, I, I will try to do what I have been inspired by those who, you know, have shown us sometimes the way forward, which is that you should never not say what you believe is right, even when the times are wrong. And I think, you know, I operate in an environment right now where a great deal of what I sometimes have to say is not necessarily what is um, what people would like to hear. But I think this is part of the, the ethic and, and the core of the United Nations also that it stands for what is right, and even when the times are tough, um, you should have that sense that there, at least, um, there is a willingness to stand by principles. And yet we fail every day, because at the end of the day, we are not floating in some free space. So I think for me personally, it is a reason to be in the United Nations today, because in fact, the very things that it stands for are so often under assault. Just briefly, Paul. Bring 
new interventions to save maximum number of people, starting with vaccines, medicines, and also bring together the community to uh, join us in doing the same on a large scale in the world. Mohamed. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll continue telling the story. Can I just say, he's no longer the future, he's the present. I mean, this is one of the fascinating things. So, uh, because we said, you know, the youth is always the future. Actually, they are the present. And that's why it's so great to have you and you as well. You have been watching the Deutsche Welle debate at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. My name is Sarah Kelly. This session has been a decade to deliver the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to all of you.